good afternoon, and good morning, and welcome to another episode of Before Coffee. We're here, and we're going to call Raj, and we're going to get ready for the day ahead. Here. Morning. Good morning, there. <coughs> uh. <laughs> All right. There's the man. All awake. Oh, I can't hear you. You muted yourself. There you go. <laughs> uh, all right, man, I'm ready for my headlines. I got something. All right, my first headline. Good morning, this is Before Coffee. Today, in the Netherlands, train crash! One oh, dead and dozens injured after carriages derailed. Space, Finally, the Netherlands is also having train crashes, it seems. Uh, fugitive Roy McGrath, ex-chief of staff to Maryland governor, captured in Tennessee. Nuclear weapons! Damaged nuclear bomb at Dutch base was a dummy weapon, Pentagon says. Saudi Arabia and OPEC cut production, raise oil prices. Ooh. Reddit Susi chair truly solid, sorry over a downfall of a 167 year old bank. And and the connected story, the uh, Masters tournament starts this week. Connection with oil prices raising. What's the connection? Also, we have a final in NCAA, and we have the uh, Trump arrest happening today. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything else? Yeah, you have, you have to do that thing you say. Oh, the Trump arrest and more. And what happened today in history. Today on the... April 4th, 2023 edition of Coffee. All right. All right, let's go. First story. Authorities say at least 50 passengers were on board the train that crashed in a, into a crane between The Hague and Leiden. A train in the Netherlands rammed into a maintenance crane on the tracks before it derailed and plowed into a field, killing the crane operator and injuring dozens of passengers. The maintenance work has planned, was planned and standard, but we have no idea how the crane got on the track, which was still open for traffic, John Vopin, the chief executive of the railway infrastructure company ProRail, said at News Brief on Tuesday. Rescue teams ferried across away the injured in a pre-dawn darkness at the scene of the incident in Vorschote, a village near The Hague. The crash happened about three at 3.25 a 3.25. A quarter after three, emergency services said. <laughs> it's 3.2. Uh, some of the injured were tra treated on the spot and 19 were taken to the hospital. Train services would be suspended for days between The Hague and Leiden, one of the busiest routes in the Netherlands, ProRail said. The crane was a part of a maintenance work on the two tracks which were closed for traffic, while two others, while two other of the total four tracks remained open for train traffic, Vopa said. Several investigations have been launched to understand reasons for the crash took place and to avoid it happening again. Dutch construction group BAM told the newspaper NRC and ANP. New a news agency that one of their employees died in the crash. It did not immediately respond to a request for comment. The driver of the passenger train was in hospital with bone fractures. Wouter Kulmes, the chief executive of the NS Dutch Railway, said at the news conference. The front carriage of the night train from Leiden City to The Hague derailed and plowed into a field. Emergency services said the second carriage was on its side. The fire broke out near the train but was soon extinguished. 
Mark Rutte, the Prime Minister, and the Netherlands, Netherlands royal family were among those who expressed their sympathy for the victims. Yeah, I hope so. That's the least they can do. As leaders of a country. <laughs> um, my thoughts are with the relatives with all the victims. I wish them all the best, Rutte said in a tweet. We deeply sympathize with all of them, King William, Alexander, and Queen Maxima said. Not only one casualty, and that was the guy in front of the train, so. Oh. Alright, in U.S. news, in fugitive news, Roy McGrath, this is from the CBS News. Roy McGrath, the former chief staff of ex-Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, who became a fugitive after failing to appear on trial, covered his story, on the wire fraud and embezzlement charges last month, was captured in Tennessee on Monday, law enforcement sources confirmed to CBS News. McGrath was located by the FBI in a car in Knoxville around 6.30 p.m. local time. During the arrest, an agent involved shooting occurred, FBI said in a statement. Subject Roy McGrath sustained injury and was transported to the hospital. He said the FBI shot him. McGrath's condition was not immediately clear. Say an agent involved shooting. So he's just saying the agent shot the guy. The federal manhunt had, had been underway since McGrath failed to appear in federal court in Baltimore, Maryland on March 13th. Warrant was issued for his arrest, and the FBI soon searched his house in Naples, Florida. He interviewed his relative. McGrath was set to be tried on federal charges stemming from his time running the Maryland Environmental Service, a quasi-government state agency that provides services like wastewater management, composting, and recycling. Prosecutors said McGrath was fraudulently, fraudulently obtained a severance payment of $23,647 when he left to take the job as home Steve staff. 20. A falsified document purporting to show the government had approved the payment. He was also accused of falsifying timesheets while vacationing in Europe and stealing money for tuition for classes at Harvard. Harvard, huh? Can't go somewhere cheap. Yeah. McGrath no. was initially, <laughs> initially indicted on federal charges in October 2021 and pleaded not guilty. Faced a maximum sentence of more than 100 years in prison if convicted on all counts. The FBI and U.S. Marshal Service each offered $10,000 reward for information leading to his arrest. So I wonder if everybody got that award. But they did find him. Okay. Story. Okay. Well, I wish I had... I wish I could embezzle money to go to Harvard. Well, actually, no, I don't. Get of rich connections. Get of rich connections would be... Okay, my next story. U.S. Defense Department released statements saying object was used in training after photo emerge of military inspection. The Pentagon said that the picture that featured in a report by the Federation of America Scientists (FAS) on Monday about apparent damage to a U.S. nuclear bomb at a Dutch airbase was a dummy weapon used for training emergency response teams. FAS published a photograph of a B-61 bomb being inspected for damage by U.S. soldiers, including two from an explosive ordnance disposal unit and a civilian. The rear of the bomb appears to have been twisted by an impact and one of the tail fins is missing. There's a pink sticky tape covering an apparent hole. The picture was included in a 2022 presentation for student job applications by Los Almos National Laboratory, LANNL, in New Mexico. Ah, oh, yes. I know that place. Alamos. Yeah, Los Alamos. One of the country's nuclear weapon facilities, and it's geolocated the image to the Vocal Air Force Base in Netherlands, one of the six bases in five European countries where a total of 100 B61 nuclear gravity bombs are being stored as part of a nuclear sharing agreement with the U.S. A FAS blog by Han Christensen, the director of the FAS Nuclear Information Proje Project, said it was unclear whether it was a real bomb or a training model. The U.S. Air Force in Europe and LANL would not comment on the photograph, but on Monday, after publication of Christensen's blog, the Pentagon said it was a dummy weapon being used as part of a training drill. At every military facility, we have a response team that has to train together. That is what this was, and the photo was put in a recruitment manual, Oscar Sierra, a Pentagon spokesperson said. 
A spokesperson for the U.S. Air Force in Europe would not comment directly on the photograph, but said, The U.S. maintains the highest level of standards for personnel and equipment supporting the strategic arsenal, which includes routine training, maintenance, and security activities to safeguard America's critical capabilities. It is U.S. policy that we can neither conform nor deny the presence or absence of nuclear weapons at any general or specific location, including specific exercises or railroad operations. The Los Alamos National Laboratory said in an email statement, no additional information is available for that photo. The B-61 bomb is the only tactical nuclear weapon left in the USS U.S. arsenal, and a hundred of them are stored in the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, Italy, and Turkey. The bombs remain U.S. property, but air crews from six other NATO allies, the five hosts plus Greece, are trained to put them on planes and fly them. In the event of hostilities, it would require the agreement of the U.S., the NATO Nuclear Planning Group, and, by dint of the history of arrangement, the U.K. Prime Minister for the weapons to be transferred to Allied planes. Such nuclear sharing operations are practiced each year in NATO's steadfast noon exercise. Most recently in November, and since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Poland has asked to be part of the arrangement. Arms control advocates have long argued that the B-61 is a military obsolete and should be withdrawn from Europe as an easy step toward disarmament. The Obama administration contemplated its withdrawal, but met with resistance from some European allies who saw it as a symbolic of the U.S. nuclear umbrella protecting them, and the idea was dropped altogether following Russia's seizure of Crimea in 2014. Instead, the weapon was modernized, and the new version, the B-6112, is due to be delivered to Europe. In November, C-17A transport planes were given safety approval to carry the B-6112 nuclear bombs, and Christensen noted that a C-17A plane flew from Albuquerque, New Mexico to Vocal Air Base a week ago, though he conscious that did not prove it was carrying any bombs. The B-61 bomb is about safe as a fully assembled nuclear weapon can be. It has good safety mechanisms and sensitive high explosives that won't detonate if exposed to fire, shock, or shrapnel. Eric Skosler, the author of Command and Control, Nuclear Weapons, The Damascus Incident, and The Illusion of Safety. The warheads were routinely trucked from the atomic weapons establishment in Berkshire to Trident submarines based on the west of Scotland are a lot more problematic. You could get significant plutonium scattering or even a small-scale nuclear detonation during an accident or a terrorist attack, and those warheads are also more vulnerable to sabotage. So, if anybody wants to blow up some nuclear bombs, go attack the submarines. I don't know who I think that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of information that seemed available. Yeah. But, wow, yeah. we can figure this Somebody out. Somebody was like, ah, the Dutch are playing with a nuclear bomb. It's like, it's not real, guys. Calm down. It's I'm sure real. there's plenty of stuff we don't know. Yeah. The stuff we don't know is scary enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, your next story. Okay. Uh, as we uh, talk about Trump turning himself in today and the entire news media trips all over themselves to cover it more thoroughly than the other network, like, I don't even know. There's absolutely no one speculation. By the way, one of the most, most virulent speculations is, This has never happened before, blah, 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 blah. Well, it has happened before. The year was, let's see, 2011, and the former candidate for vice president was John Edwards, who in 2004 is running mate of John Kerry. Here's a story from Insider. Remind us, former president, can, president, vice presidential candidate. Legal experts are debating what the outcome of the trial might be after a Manhattan grand jury indicted former President Trump on Thursday. Likely over a hush money payment made of oh, film actress Stormy Day. Comes out it's probably 34 felony counts, maybe? It's pretty serious. Those experts don't have to look far to find precedent. Precedent. The last time a grand jury criminally charged a presidential candidate for payments made to a mistress, John Edwards, faced up to 30 years, 30 years, and 1.5 million in fine. That was, that was 2011, and everybody's completely forgotten. Edwards was John Kerry's vice presidential running mate in 2004 in a pair of losing in the pair's losing race against Bush and Cheney prior to launching his own presidential campaign in 2008. Felony charges 
Former North Carolina Senator faced in 2011 one count of conspiracy to violate one count of a conspiracy to violate federal campaign finance laws and lie to the Federal Election Commission. Four counts of accepting and receiving illegal campaign contributions. One count of concealing those illegal donations from the FEC stemmed from his own 2008 campaign. Each carried a maximum five-year term in prison and a $250,000 fine. Mr. Edwards alleged to have accepted more than 900000 in effort to conceal from his public facts that he believed to harm his candidates. Assistant Attorney General Bauer said in a 20, June 2011 Department of Justice this statement regarding the incident, a year-long investigation and trial alleged that Edwards is inspired with his campaign staff to hide. In 2007, the candidate was fathered a daughter with his mistress, all while his wife battled breast cancer. So, the corollary or the similarity here is, he was he was having an affair while his wife had breast cancer. Trump was having pregnant. Very, very similar. Edwards later admitted to the affair that was that he was the father of the girl and financially supported the pair. His wife Elizabeth filed for separation after Edwards admitted the child was his, but died after Ill, of her illness before the criminal charges were brought. Oh, that's In convenient. The case of, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Another conspiracy. <laughs> and that she was a really nice lady. In, in the case against him, DOJ officials argued Edwards orchestrated a series of legal donations to provide hush money payments to his They conspired with the staff to lie about the affair and cover up the illegal donations with the check memos like chairs, an antique table, and bookcase. Wait, that was it. Not, people would notice <laughs> those. What the hell? <laughs> legal expert. Well, nobody notices about a lot of bookcases this year. Yeah, 17 of them. Yeah. I donated some of them to a library. That's yeah, why you don't see them. That's right. Yeah, you don't see them books laid on a floor, do you? <laughs> legal experts. <laughs> legal experts are the case. Because the charges were not based on a specific federal statute, but an advisory CE FEC opinion and argued gifts made to political candidates and campaign contributions. Washington Post reported at the time. After nine days of deliberations, a jury acquitted Edwards of one charge of accepting a donation. He reported, but was hopelessly deadlocked on the other five counts, resulting in a mistrial. The Department of Justice chose not to retry Edwards' political report in 2012. It is not illegal to be a pig. Brett Capel, Washington Campaign Finance Report, told the Washington Post at the time. Is what Edwards did slimy? Absolutely. Everyone will agree it was reprehensible. It's, it's not a crime. Slime. But it's not a crime. Edwards did not respond to the insider's request for comment, which was sent to his law firm. So the big difference here is Edwards would be in cross for something that was not even actually defined as a crime at the time. More like FEC guideline. Yeah. Bro. Oh. Trial for something that someone has already gone to prison for. Big difference. You're sorry. All right. <clears throat> My story. You're going to be talking about the Credit Suisse chair being truly sorry after the downfall of the 167 year old bank. Boss apologizes to investors for crisis that left bank without a choice of UBS takeover or bankruptcy. Chair of the Credit Suisse has told shareholders. That the lender failed to stem the crisis that led to its emergency takeover by UBS last month. Axel Le Lehman told investigators of Gavin Zurich on Tuesday that bosses had legitimate plans to turn the bank around, but had been thwarted by market panic over the wider health of global banking sector after the collapse of the US tech lender Silicon Valley Bank the previous weekend. He said the bank fought hard to find a solution, but was ultimately left with two options, either strike a deal with UBS or declare bankruptcy. We stand here today in the situation that no one could have anticipated, Limon said. It's a sad day for you and for us, so I can understand the bitterness, the anger, and the shock of all those who are disappointed, overwhelmed, and affected by the developments. 
We wanted to pull all our energy and our efforts into turning the situation around. It pains me that we didn't have the time to do so in the fateful week in March our plans were thwarted, and for that I am truly sorry. He added, I apologize that we are no longer able to stem the loss of trust that accumulated over the years and for disappointing you. Credit Suisse was sold to UBS through a Swiss government orchestrated emergency takeover on 19 March as a panic over the health of the financial system swelled after the collapse of SVP, SVB earlier that month. The Swiss lender had long been struggling to keep customers in turn profits after a prolonged series of scandals, compliance problems, and bad financial bets. However, confidence was almost wiped out in mid-March after its largest shareholder, the Saudi National Bank, ruled out providing further funding because of regulations that effectively kept its investment. The Swiss authorities are forced to step in, originally offering a 50 billion Swiss finance, or uh, sorry, Swiss franc line of credit, and eventually ushering in a takeover by Credit Suisse's larger domestic rival, UBS, four days later. The man said that only the other option would have been bankruptcy. This would have led to the worst scenario, namely a total loss for shareholders, unpredictable risk for clients, severe consequence for the economy and the global financial markets, he said. It was our duty to protect the interests of our shareholders as best as we could to provide security to our clients. We did everything we could within our... that was possible. Within what was possible. That's my short story on the bankers apologizing for being bad at banking. I like how our stories like back then. Oh, thank you. And banks just basically keep your money and do what they want to it. The government goes, we don't care. We'll 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 guarantee it. <laughs> but on my story, I'm combining two. Like the oil price jump with Live Golf, which is both related to Saudi Arabia. Oil prices jump as OPEC production cuts. Cut draws U.S. concern a Saudi-led move. Saudi-led move to reduce the out output among major oil producers pushed prices higher. The White, White House said it didn't think the cuts were warranted. Oil prices surged Monday, and U.S. officials voiced their displeasure a day after OPEC members announced a substantial cut in production. The move that re reaffirmed Saudi Arabia, the group's leader, as a headstrong giant in oil market. Traders bid up the crude prices after a day of news. Of the cuts totally more than 1.1 million barrels per day or 1% global production hitting next month. So they don't even wait production to go down before they jack them. Brent crude, the international benchmark, raising more, rose more than 6%. Means gas prices instantly rose 10%. Everybody's a crook. West Texas intermediate crude, U.S. standard, was up by a similar amount, trading at $80. Sunday's surprise announcement signaled a potential new threat of global efforts to cover inflation and challenge the Biden administration, which has pushed for lower gasoline prices. I don't think that the production cuts are advisable at the moment, given the market uncertainty. But we made that clear, said John F. Kirby, spokesman for the National Security Council. But we also don't have a seat at the table. While my, Mr. Kirby said the White House was given an advance word of the cutback to move would further aggravate strained relations by the United States and Saudi Arabia. Last year, President Biden made special appearance to Saudi, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman al Riyadh, increased oil production. I Riyadh, it's got an H in there. H do. What's an H do? Nothing. It does nothing. <laughs> Only to have OPEC and an organization of petroleum importing countries trim its output in its next meeting. And related news. The Masters Golf Tournament gets lay, gets underway on Thursday. It's the first time eight there are 18 live golfers playing when regular PGA Tour golfers. Last year, the PGA acted to ban live golfers from the regular tour, but the Masters is one of the major tournaments, one of the four majors that can basically you invite whoever they them. want to. Yeah. The, the Masters is so big, they don't care what you think about the PGA. Yeah, he's like, okay, we're inviting who we want. So, list the golfers. The golfers are presented by an intimidating pension of players at the Masters Tournament, which gets underway in Augusta, Georgia on Thursday. Total of 18 lift golf pros will be competing in the green jacket in Augusta, fronted by six former Masters champions. Bill Mickelson, 
Charles Schwartzel, Bubba Watson, Sergio Garcia, Patrick Reed, and Justin Dustin Johnson, all former, all former Master Champion, that have joined the Live Golf Tour, which basically guarantees it's sponsored by Saudi Arabia. Other Live Golf players in Augusta are Brooks Kepka, Bryson DeChambeau, Cameron Smith, Ito Piera, Joaquin Neiman, Abe Anser, to get the Mexican guys in there too. Thomas <laughs> Peterson, Harold Varner, you gotta have a black guy, Harold Varner, okay? Uh, Jason Kokrak, Kevin Na, gotta have an Asian, and Louis Oosthuizen, who is, I believe. German? Jewish? Uh, I think <laughs> Sweetie. What about the Jewish Norwegian. people playing golf? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you gotta get the Jewish person I, in. I don't know, man. That's a religion, Mark. You yeah. can tell, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Neiman? No, no, he's Mexican. Joaquin. Joaquin. Uh, Live Golf was bold plan. As as if the rancor between the PGA Tour and Live Golf needs more fuel poured into its fire. Live Golf CEO Greg Norman, who's Australian, Australian, has revealed recent recently a plan by the league's players to celebrate in the 18th hole if one of them ends up winning the championship. They've said that if one of them wins and the other 17 will hang around there and congratulate them on the 18th green. So they're going to make a big font out of it. I got it. All right. Golf, turn it nasty. Your story. Okay. The one, the one of the most pointless sports, I've always said. I mean, chasing a white ball all over a green field? Yeah. And specifically the that? part where they... They destroy land, right, for the field, and then it's like, wow, oh, the people's lands. houses houses could be there. No, we need to water oh. this field, and no one's allowed to be here except for the rich people who <laughs> pay for it. Yeah, you're gonna get George Carlin territory. We're gonna go off. No, on that's cemetery. exactly what I saw. I saw that recently as well. It was he had a whole thing about like, let's go hit a ball on a field, guy. <laughs> All the Lucky water that goes in the first into place. the field, you know. People are dying of dehydration. It's like, but we gotta it, water the golf field, guys. But there is absolutely no reason to live unless you can golf when you're so. Yeah. Um, All right, and ahead. my next story on culture. Ruby Bridges, how a 90s Disney movie about racism calls the culture war. A 1998 TV movie about school segregation has led to a white mother worrying about her child feeling guilty about racism. Before the, the made-for-TV film Ruby Bridges made it its ABC Network premiere on Sunday night of Martin Luther King weekend in 1998, a taped address from the White House set the tone. Disney CEO Michael Eisner overviewed the 1954 Supreme Court decision that cleared a path for the six-year-old black girl to begin integrating in New Orleans public schools in 1960 and nodded at the protests and violence Bridges and other school integration pioneers triggered nationwide. President Bill Clinton recalled his whitewashed Arkansas childhood, noting that he never went to a school with a person of another race until attending college at Georgetown. We've come a long way since 1954, Clinton remarked, but we still have a long way to go. Perhaps the greatest lesson we can learn from Ruby Bridges is that every one of us has the power to stand up against injustice and stand up for the ideals that make America great. When a sign of times, that's no longer the prevailing mood now. Last month, a white woman named Emily Conklin filed a formal complaint with the Canelius County School in Florida, exempting her second grade daughter from watching the film at St. Petersburg North Shore Elementary, where she is a student. Tipped off by a permission slip that was sent home, Conklin disclosed that after pre-screening the first 15 minutes of the movie, she objected to the film using the word Negro and nigga, one depiction of a child putting a noose around a doll's neck and adults screaming, I'm gonna hang you! She fears a film might teach kids how to be racist. Last week, Pineal school officials responded by banning the film at North Shore pending reassessment from a review committee. According to a direct spokesman, Conklin's complaint prompted two other families to opt their kids out of screening the film. That's all they should have done, by the way. I don't want my kids seeing that film. Okay, bye. But instead they made it into a whole big deal. I don't we want anybody to restructure our entire that. curriculum, you know? Yeah. That's what's happening in Florida. You can stand up and walk out of it. 
It's offensive to me, personally. It's totally fine. You have that choice. It's weird when they you tell yeah. everyone else they don't have that choice, right? Oh, yeah. It's so when they make a law. <laughs> so you can't see the film, yeah. But you even as it remains offended. available within the district's other school libraries, there is a fear that it could be the latest casualty in the sprawling political push to ban any content that could be deemed Maybe. too woke by the state. Tony Morrison, The Bluest Eyes, biographies about baseball trailblazers Hank Aaron and Robert Clement, black history lessons that were once state mandated have suddenly come up for discussion under Florida's Stop Woke Act, a 2022 law that essentially permits history lessons that has white guilt as a takeaway. Ron Regrettably, the Fascist. Huh? Ron the Fascist is the... Oh, okay. This is how I call him for fashion. Regrettably, wrote former St. Petersburg Police Chief and Deputy Major Goliath Davis in a recent editorial, the political environment surrounding MAGA Republicans, Mothers of Liberty, and Governor Ron DeSantis continues to form a movement of division, historical denial, and instability. That the film is suddenly a touch too strong for their taste is an unexpected twist. Ruby Bridges is a quintessential slice of Disney history, one that takes Norman Rockwell's searing portrait of Ruby being in escorted into New Orleans' all-white William France Grammar School under federal protection and put in a soft focus. Ruby, Charles Monet, is a baseball-loving brainiac with deep reservation reserves of compassion. Mom, waiting to exhale Lila Rochon, is her resolute emotional shield, and Dad, truth be told, Michael Beach, is a disillusioned Korean War veteran who regains his faith in humanity when the bigots come around to his daughter. On top of the schmaltz, the film is suffused with white heroes from the open-minded child psychiatrist Kevin Pollack, who re re revels in Ruby's intellectual brilliance to the racist vice principal Diana Scarwide, whose heart eventually softens. At one point, Ruby's teacher, Carlito Ways, Penelope Ann Miller says, There was a time in South when white people owned Negroes like you, would own a pet or a toy, but I'm from the North, and we never thought that way. It's a hell of a whooper coming from a lady who's meant to be from Boston. <laughs> Let's be honest, Boston, not the most friendly <laughs> to, to people of color. Uh, the power isn't lost on Conklin, who has effectively scrubbed herself from the internet as an online critic sus. Critics suss out her political alliances and call out the hypocrisy of her waging a culture war while also working as the development director of a local YMCA. But the real irony is that Conklin may be miscast as the villain in the story. Her complaint doesn't exactly call for the film to be banned. It merely suggests that it could be too mature for younger students. Instead, she recommends saving it for 8th grade American history class, or if not possible, send home a letter explaining the material. Overall, it seems that she's calling for context, not cuts. Something like that special message from the White House. More in the, there's more in the movie, he wrote in a complaint while remarking on inherent and educational value in Ruby Bridges, but I ran out of space to type it. So she's not really the villain. It's the people who are taking one small thing, making it a huge big deal, and then saying we should just ban it. That will save everything. If you can't you use nuance, just go directly for the throat. That's what you should do. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is the government that right wing wants. They want the government that feeds them information and prevents them from seeing it. That's what they want. Hmm. Okay. Oh no, it's harmful or it's gonna hurt your feelings. Don't don't watch it. Thanks, Dad. What happened to these Republicans complaining about the nanny state? Where did that go? Where did that happen? <laughs> the nanny state's gonna take care of us. Okay. Today in the today in history, this day in history. Of course, recent history, we have four new astronauts going to the moon, or around Yay. the moon anyway. They are Rick Wiseman, the mission commander. Reed, sorry, Reed Wiseman, I can't read. Victor Glover, the pilot. Christina Ka Koch, a pronounced mission specialist. And Jeremy, Jeremy Henson, Hansen, also a mission specialist. The first three are NASA astronauts, and Mr. Hansen, is a member of the Canadian Space Agency. So he's going to first Canadian go to the moon. And the first person named Jeremy to go to the moon also. When we were selecting astronauts back then, Mr. Glover said in an interview, we intended to select the same person, just multiple copy. Mr. Koch, Ms. Koch, will be the first woman to venture beyond low Earth orbit. And Mr. Hansen, as a Canadian, the first non-American to travel that far. 
So I am excited. What is it? Does the space know that he's not American? So I'm American. So I'm excited. Mrs. Mrs. Koch, Ms. Koch said during an event unveiling the crew at Ellington Field, a small airport used by NASA for the training the astronauts. Absolutely, but my real question, are you excited? The assembled crowd cheered in response. Also this day in history. Wrap this thing up. William Henry Harrison, after after serving one term, well, I'm sorry, after serving one month of his first term, died in office because he stood outside and gave a speech too long on his inauguration. I had basically have pneumonia. Population of of sixteen hundred dollars in eighteen fifty. Sorry, it was eighteen forty one. William Harrison died. In 1850, Los Angeles was incorporated as a city with 1,600 people. In 1862, in the American Civil War, U.S. Union forces under General George B. McClellan became the, incess and the unsuccessful Peninsular Campaign to capture the Confederate capital of Richmond. American poet Maya Angelou was born on this day in 1928. 1913, it was says with a question mark, Muddy Waters, American blues guitarist, was born on this day. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, was formed on this day in 1949, including Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, United Kingdom, and the United States. All listed in alphabetical order. It, the peace symbol designed by Gerald Holtum became the per, first uh, symbol for uh, displayed by the British campaign for nuclear disarmament. Also in this day, Ben Hur became the first film to win 11. Academy Awards, including Best Director William Wyler and Lead Actor Charlton Heston. Bill Gates and Paul Allen, formed Microsoft, became the world's largest computer software company. Oh no, it's where all our doom started. Oh yeah, lots of stuff happened on April 4th. American film creator Roger Ebert died at the age of 70 after fighting off bone cancer. And most poignant, all birthdays will go with Heath, Heath Ledger, the late Heath Ledger in 1979, was born in 1979. Robert Downey Jr. was born in 1965. Anthony Perkins famously played uh, Mr. Norman Bates, the hotel owner in Psycho, was born in this day in 1932. And famously and poignantly on this day, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated at the Lorraine Hotel in Memphis, Tennessee by, assa by assassin James Bay. All right. So many so, things. So on this day, 55 years ago, Martin Luther King. And that's also where we were lost. <laughs> The world went one, down. One of the world's tragic events that was ab absolutely... Internal, internal assassination necessary. even, right? Yeah, who even knows what was behind it? Oh, yeah, somebody knows. They say yeah, it was a lone gun. They, <laughs> they always say it's a lone gunman that happened. Okay. A random guy. We never found him. How conspicuous. No, no, they found him right away. Oh, did they? Okay. He actually escaped from prison later. Um, all right, that was it. All it's right, well, history. that's been Allison here from the Netherlands discussing train derailments and how banks are still banks. And hey, I Roger. hope to see you tomorrow from some more deliberations on the rest of what's going on. Don't get crazy out there. Take care of each other. Be safe. Happy, happy April 4th, 2023.
be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notify buttons, and follow our other channels, Toxic Alley, History of Gravy, and Scratchy Old Records.